Hello, welcome to Numeristical. We are continuing our series on baseball prediction. We're now in the eighth video of the series where we're going to take the bullpen features that we created last time and add them into the model, see what kind of performance increase we get, do a little bit of analysis, and then decide what are the next steps you want to take to improve the model further. So if you remember last time we developed these bullpen features and we did this by essentially finding the statistics of the whole game and subtracting out the starting pitcher's contribution to the statistics and therefore concluding that the rest came from the bullpen. Once we got that, we were able to aggregate over the previous N games, where N could be 10 or 35 or 75, whatever number you want. You aggregate over those previous games to get the performance of the bullpen in recent games and use those features as predictors for the, the next game. So. Before we move to the notebook, I'd like to, again, ask if you could please like this video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps me out a lot. If you want to go even further, you can turn on notifications. I'll be uh, releasing videos in pretty quick succession going forward. So if you have that notification bell turned on, you'll know as soon as the next one comes out, you'll be able, you'll be able to keep up with things very nicely. So with that said, let's move on to the notebook. So here we're going to add add these bullpen features to the model, see if they improve things. So let's load in our data from last time, this DFBP7 is our data. We're going to create the same train valid and test sets that we used before. So the training data will be from 1981 through and including 2018. We'll use 2019, 2020 as a validation set just for early stopping. And we will then evaluate our performance on the 2021 and 2022 seasons. So you can see that we've, uh, we've now added in quite a lot of columns. So this is all the columns we have in our model, and you can see we have many, many things that we've added in from starting back when we just had the retro sheet data. Now, if you remember when we previously did model building, we, uh, we'd go through multiple cells where we would choose our features, train the model, make the predictions, look at the log losses, do some analysis of the features with SHAP values and so forth. So to streamline this a little bit, I, uh, I created a function called try features, where you can just give it the feature set that you're looking at, optionally give a max depth. We're going to stick with the max depth too. Um, and it will do all those steps in one function call. So it'll, it'll create your X's, your feature sets. It will train your model, make the predictions, tell you here's how you, your model now compares to the Vegas model, and then it'll even give you the average chat values so you could get a sense of which features are most important to the model. And it saves this all in a dictionary so that you can then reference it later if you want. So to just go back a little bit, let's, in the last, Last time we did modeling, which is when we added in the starting pitching, we played around with a few different models and, you know, generally got, you know, plus or minus two basis points. They were all about the same performance. So to rewind a little bit, I'm going to pick one of these models that was one of the more simple ones that still gave very good performance, where we have two hitting statistics, the on-base percentage and the slugging percentage of the teams, and then these four starting pitching statistics, which was the walks it's over innings pitched, the total bases plus walks. So this is kind of like a modified slugging that we talked about, where you basically get one point for a single or a walk, two points for a double, three points for a home, uh, triple, four points for a home run. And on a, at that basis, on average, how many points you get. So it's sort of like, sort of like an on-base plus, plus slugging, but measured in terms of, uh, measured, I think, a little more accurately. We've also got the hits and walks percentage, so it's kind of like your on-base percentage from the point of view of the starting pitcher, the opposing uh, on-base percentage. And then you've got the strikeout percentage, what percentage of the batters that they face do they actually strike out. And we saw previously that most of the time, looking at 35 games was a good number. For the look back, but for the strikeout percentage, I actually found looking back 10 games to be a little more effective. And I don't quite know what that comes from, but it could just be that, um, 
you know, maybe pitchers tire over the season, the strikeout percentage might measure sort of how their arm is feeling a little better. Again, hypothesis. I don't know if that's that's truly what's going on. Um, but let's run this function, define it, and let's just demonstrate that last model with, with just hitting and starting pitching, how it does. So you see, we call, make this one function call, it trains the model, evaluates on the test set, and you see the Vegas probability was 0.6675. Our model, um, uh, our model is 0.6745. So we're about 70 basis points off the Vegas model. This was before we added the bullpen. And these were the average shot values of the various features. You see the starter strikeout percentage over the last 10 games was, was a really strong one. It really seems to capture the quality of the starting pitcher and how they're pitching now. So to add in the bullpen, let's first just try um, taking these same four features that we had based on the starters and applying them to the bullpen. And let's just use the 35 game look back and see how that does. Okay. And, uh, Let's see, adding those bullpen features in, we're now 48 and a half basis points uh, worse than the Las Vegas probability. So we've gone from 70 away to 48 away. So that's a pretty significant move. We've, we've improved 22 basis points. Um, and you can see uh, these bullpen statistics, they're not as influential as most of the other ones. They're kind of blow down on the list but they still obviously in aggregate improve the performance of the model. Next thing I want to try is to try different time windows for the bullpen. So when we created them, we, we did uh, arbitrarily chose three different look back sizes, 75 games, 35 games, and 10 games. Let's add them all in and see if that moves the needle at all for our performance. Okay, so now we're within 38 and a half basis points. So previously we did, we were at 48 and now we're at 38. So we've improved another 10 basis points. So that, that's, I think that's meaningful. I mean, I think that's, you know, if you remember the plots we did before about how likely or unlikely you are to get these changes. Um, it seems like this is improving things. So let's, Let's see if with the starting pitching, let's revisit the starting pitching and see, okay, what if we, we did the same thing with the starting pitching, we threw in all of these time windows. Let's see if this improves our performance or not. Okay, so adding in all these starting pitching features, and we see now we're 43 basis points away from Vegas before we were 38. So we actually did about five basis points worse. Now that could just be coincidence. Um, Again, you have to remember there's some randomness in this, but it does not seem that adding in the different lookbacks for the starters has the same impact as it did for, for the bullpen. Now, I could speculate a little bit. This is all speculation as to why this is the case. One possibility is that the bullpen has a bit more dynamics to it over time because the bullpen is a collection of people. That collection of people changes over time. How they're used might change over time. Whereas the starting starting pitcher refers to one individual, and you know we expect the pitching quality of that individual might be a little bit more static over time than of a, a, a composition of, of different bullpen pitchers. Again, totally speculation. I don't know if that's really why that's the case. But that's, uh, so adding in that st those starting pitching features do not seem to have improved it the way it did for the bullpen. So let's rewind back to the model three where we had, again, we have these two, this is our best model so far. We've got two team hitting features, four starting pitcher features, and 12 bullpen features. And of course there's all times two because you've got the home team and the away team. So now we haven't done much with hitting and the fact that we only have two hitting features and so many different pitching related features means maybe, maybe we can get a little more um, 
a little more information out of what we have about the team hittings. And specifically, I wanted to try to analyze things that are seem different from that wouldn't be captured by on base percentage and slugging. So one is errors, so something about fielding. So errors are not necessarily the greatest indication of how good a team of fielding is, but it's what we have now. So let's let's put it in, see if it helps. And similarly, stolen bases and caught stealing. So stolen bases, if you talk to baseball sabermetrics folks, they will tell you that you know stolen bases are not really that valuable to a team, and that um, you know the the advantage that you gain by moving up a base compared to the loss that you suffer if that runner gets thrown out is very disproportionate. So I'm going to put in both stolen bases and caught stealing, see if that helps balance things out. Also put in the errors and see whether this improves our model at all from, from our model three, which is currently our best model. Okay, so we are now at 42 basis points off the Vegas model. So it does not see, it seems to be about the same as the previous model and four points worse than our model three. So it does not seem to have improved things. Again, this could be noise. If we look at our shot values and try to see where, so you see the first stolen, first one of these variables is over here, stolen bases for the visiting team, which was over here on the list. Then you got the errors. Stolen bases for the home team are somehow found to be much less significant. I suspect this is just a, this is just noise. I don't think this is really a signal here. Um, and the caught ceilings are even further down the list. But let's let's look at some ice plots and just see see if how they're capturing these variables. Okay. So again, we see with the on base percentage and the slugging. I just I just did one point on these ice plots. We only have one curve on each of them because I wanted to I wanted to get a little bit more resolution that sometimes gets lost when you plot multiple points. So again. On base percentage makes sense. The higher it is for the home team, the more likely they are to win. The higher it is for the visiting team, the less likely the home team will win. Same with slugging. Now errors, at least we see directionally, it seems to be capturing something. Again, this, this part way on the left where it jumps up way on the left, the extreme left and the extreme right of these ice plots, you sometimes have to ignore because there's usually not a lot of data. This is in ranges of the data where there are not that many data points. So you want to focus your attention on kind of the center of the curve. And if you look at the center of this error 162 home, you see that at least it's directionally right. As you make more errors, the home team is less likely to win as the home team makes more errors. And you see for this particular data point, it goes down from about, you know, goes down about a percentage point from this top part to this bottom part. So that seems at least, you know, plausible, reasonable. And same with the visiting team. As the visiting team makes more errors, they are less likely to win. The home team is more likely to win. Now, if we look at stolen bases, so one thing you see is that for the home team, we only found this one cut point. It only, it only has this one step to it. So that suggests that it's not really finding very much signal. And that's for the home team. For the visiting team, it finds more steps. But this looks a little incoherent to me, right? That for the home team, if you look, it only made, it has one step, and that step only represents half a percentage point of winning. Whereas on the visiting team, you've got multiple steps, and together takes it down several percentage points. So it doesn't seem right to me that, that um, there would be such a different effect for the home team and the visiting team. Maybe there's something I'm missing. But, um, you know, this suggests to me that, like, we're, you know, we're not capturing a good signal. I don't really believe this signal yet. And with caught stealing, we actually see the opposite effect, right? For the home team, as you get caught stealing more, it actually finds you more likely to win by a relatively small amount if you look at the y-axis on the CS162 home graph. Um, and the visiting team, again, you don't really, there's not a lot going on. Again, if you ignore the extreme left and extreme right, it's basically flat. So, um, so I, I don't feel confident that, that this model is capturing 
anything useful about soul based cost theory. And uh, part of the problem might be that when you're building tree based models and you've got two variables, and it's really important to have the context of one for the other to, to denote the contribution of the other, often tree based models struggle a little bit to harvest the signal from this. So, in this case, where more stolen bases is good, but only if you're not getting caught stealing so much, right? Um, it often struggles to, to, to find the right correspondence between those two. And so one key for feature engineering, when you are building models using something like boosting that's using a tree-based model, is it's often useful if you know these two things interact and if there's a way to combine them into one model, into one number. So I have one feature which captures both of these effects that will often be a useful thing to do and you'll, you'll see it reflected in your model's performance. So I'm going to try to demonstrate this. So let's make a new number that's our adjusted stolen basis, which is going to be the stolen basis minus three times the caught stealing. Now, why did I say minus 3x the, the, the caught stealing? Well, if you poke around and, and look at what, how people have tried to analyze the value of a stolen base, you'll see a lot of references that say roughly 75% is kind of the break even. You need to be successful more than 75% of the time for it to help you because the getting out is so much worse of a disadvantage then getting that extra base is an advantage. So what does that mean? If you need to be successful 75% of the time, that means for every three stolen bases uh, you have, you can only have one caught stealing. And that's like the break even. So if you've got three times as many stolen bases as caught stealings, it's probably going to net out. The idea is it'll kind of net out to zero. If you're less than that, it should be kind of a net negative for your team. And if you're Stronger than that should be a net positive. Again, this is somewhat subjective, but it's trying to capture what we, how we think these two features interact. So we could define these features, and then we've got to redefine our data frames to integrate this newly created feature. And then let's add them into our model. So I'm going to take, again, our model three, that was our best performing model so far. I'm going to, instead of including, I'm going to add in the errors like before, and instead of including stolen bases and caught stealing separately, I'm just going to add in the stolen bases adjusted. And let's run this and see whether we notice any difference in the performance. Okay, so we're done, and let's see, we're 42 basis points off the Las Vegas model. And our model three was 38 and a half. So we're four points worse. So it didn't really seem to move the needle much, this attempt at feature engineering that I did. Um, but again, let's let's look at the ice plots and just see whether, at least directionally, they seem to be doing any better. Okay, so this finished. And uh, let's now look. So now, when we look at the stolen bases adjusted, it at least directionally seems um, consistent in that when it's higher for the home team, it increases their probability of winning. We see a few steps here, so it's not quite so um, so much of a staircase as it was before, where it just had a single step. Here it's a staircase, but at least there's a few, few different steps that it's finding. Again, for the visiting team, we get a little more definition, a little more of a signal. I'm not sure what's going on there. But um, even though it didn't improve the performance, at least this seems a little bit more coherent. Again, it still, still bothers me a little bit that it seems to be having this bigger effect for the visiting team. Um, but the point is that, again, because the evaluation on the test set might often be noisy, it's a good idea to look at these ice plots and just see if when I added these variables in, is what the model doing with them even making any sense? And if it's not making any sense that I know, okay, I just can't get the signal out of this. I should just leave it alone. Whereas if you're putting something in, it seems to modestly capture the signal. 
you at least have a little bit more faith that, okay, maybe this is doing something useful. So again, this is all heuristics and judgment, but um, it's something to look at. Okay, let's do a little bit, oops, let's do a little bit of analysis now of this model. So we want to compare our model to Vegas. And let's take a little bit of an overview of what you need to make money off of Vegas. So to use these models to actually make money, you need a few things to happen. One is you have to make predictions that are occasionally different from what Vegas is predicting, right? So even if we got this model and we improved everything and now, okay, our probabilities line up exactly with the Las Vegas probabilities all the time. We're not going to be able to make any money with it because Vegas is taking plus or minus 2% on their, their vigorous, right? So if our model is saying the same thing that Vegas is saying, there's no way to make any money. So we could even do a little better than Vegas. If we're 1% more accurate, so every time Vegas takes, makes a prediction, they say 64% and we say 65% or 63%. And even if we're right, that discrepancy is not big enough to make money off of because of this, this edge that Vegas has. So to make money, what you need is you need to occasionally, at least occasionally, make predictions that are significantly different from what Vegas predicts. And in those situations, you have to be right, or at least more right than wrong. So when Vegas says 60% and you say, no, I actually think it's 70%, you need to be right that it's 70% over the long over the long run when that situation happens, you know, a thousand times. Your 70% has to be accurate, not their 60%. Um, so we can start analyzing our model in terms of not just overall is the log loss better or worse, because while that's an indication of how good your performance is, it's not exactly what you need to be Pegasus, right? So let's, let's look at, first of all, how do our predictions compare with the Vegas predictions? So this is a scatter plot. On the x-axis, we have Vegas's predictions. On the y-axis, we have the model predictions. And this line is the line y equals x, so it's where the x and y are the same. Now, if you look at this cloud of points, you'll see it's tilted a little bit. It's not aligned with that line y equals x. It's tilted a little bit. And this is what's often called regression to the mean. And what's happening here is that our model is more conservative than the Las Vegas model. So our model does not predict extreme values to the extent that Las Vegas does. So for example, if you look at 0.7 and you look at all the points to the right of 0.7, you'll see there's a fair number of points that are to the right of 0.7. These are games where Vegas has predicted the home team is going to win 70% or more of the time. But if you look at our model and look at the points that are above 0.7 on the y-axis, we'll see very few points there. So Vegas has a lot of games where they confidently say this team's going to win 70% of the time. Uh, but our model does not make as many of those extreme predictions. So that tells us that our model is not as discriminative. So remember, you could, you could be perfectly calibrated and just predict 53.8% of the time for the home team every time. And you'll be right, it'll be 53.8% of the time each of those games. But you, you won't be discriminative. You really want your model to be discriminative and be correct and be calibrated. So to be discriminative, you have to predict, make predictions that are closer to zero and one. So the Vegas model is more discriminative than our model is. Now, let's look at these discrepancies. We could also just take the discrepancy, meaning our prediction minus the Vegas prediction of the home team win probability. And if you just do a histogram, you see that we're almost always within 10% of what Vegas predicts. And, you know, you have these small tails where we differ by more than 10% our model from the Vegas prediction of the game. So, what, what is theoretically possible to happen, it could be that, hey, on some of these games, we're off by a little bit, 
and, and Vegas is right on those games. But when we differ, we're right. Like when, when we differ, one of the models is, is more right. So to, to analyze this, let's look at just the games on these two tails where the discrepancy is more than 0.1 or less than negative 0.1, where we differ by more than 10% on our assessment of the game and compare the performance of our model versus the Vegas model. And what you see is we get a log loss of 0.6763, and they're getting 0.6479. So they're doing considerably better. Vegas is doing considerably better on these cases where the model, our model, and the Vegas probabilities differ by a lot. Vegas is usually right. They're doing much better predicting those games. And this makes sense. This is not at all unexpected, right? So Vegas has these big operations. There are people that, you know, have scouts in the games, talk to people in the locker room, find out, you know, who went out drinking last night, might not be <laughs> pitching their best and so forth. So it, it, it's, it's not surprising that when Vegas makes these big jumps, that, that they are right. They're going to have some of these some of these things in their model that factor into their probabilities that are not going to be reflected by our model. Now, if we look at what happens in the rest of the games, we see that it's, it's pretty close. Now, some of this is just a function of, okay, if you, obviously, if you pick the games where we have close predictions, there's not much room for the log losses to be too different. But um, nevertheless, you still see on, on this set of games, which is most of the games, we're only about... 23 basis points off from Vegas. So this is just a little bit of analysis to show that while the log loss is giving us an overall quality of the model, um, the, the analysis for how could you make money off a model is a little different. And it's you, you, there are possible situations where the model will do better on average, but is not useful for making money. And there are possible situations where the model is actually doing worse on average, but is still useful for making money. That's probably unlikely in practice, the second scenario, but it's something to keep in mind. So in the big picture, where are we? We're about 40 basis points away from the Vegas probabilities, down from 70. So adding this bullpen got us almost half the way of what was left uh, to, to, the, to the Vegas probability. But when we disagree with Vegas, Vegas is generally right. And we've also, we've run out of some of the big wins in terms of just something that was, something important that was completely missing from our, our model. Because now we've got the hitting, we've got the starting pitching, we've got the bullpen pitching. Those are kind of the main factors. What are we missing? Well, our hitting doesn't reflect the actual starting lineup. So that might be a place to look for uh, some improved performance, improved discrimination. We don't have anything about fielding other than these errors, which we saw were not really that useful. So there are analyses out there that give players fielding ratings that really look at their range, that look at where they position themselves, that look at their arm strength. Now, again, some of the positioning stuff maybe not, might not be as applicable anymore going forward because of the rule changes. So it's another thing you gotta keep in mind. We might add in something about their fielding that might do really well at predicting in 2011 and 2012, and then might not be useful for predicting 2023. So another practical wrinkle that takes us away from kind of the theory of the model. Another thing we might want to look at is lefties versus righties. So I haven't, haven't spent any time talking about this, but if you follow baseball, you know that in general, when a left, left-handed pitcher faces a left-handed batter, it favors the pitcher. Uh, so batters do better against the opposite handed pitcher and pitchers do better against the same handed hitter. And this, this comes into play often because you might have a team that has, for example, very good left-handed hitters. They're, if their two or three best hitters are all left-handers, they'll tend to be more, more weak against a left-handed pitcher. So you might have a situation where, oh, against this team, a left-handed pitcher is going to come in and, you know, a sort of middle-of-the-road left-hander might do better against this team than a very good right-hander. And right now our features won't capture that. 
So that's something else we might want to add, and that, that could be significant. It's hard to know until you do it. Um, so what are our next steps going to be? Well, next thing I want to do is get some of the individual batter data and to make some features based on here's the actual starting lineup. So this will help us cut through some of the noise about what happens when a star hitter is injured, a uh, star hitter is resting for the day, so forth. I also want to analyze the runs scored and the over-under. So this is another bet. We haven't talked too much about it, but another bet you can make is what's the total run scored of the game? And I think this is a case where our modeling approach actually might have more of an edge. Because one nice thing about baseball is you can really model it as two separate two separate games going on. In one game, you've got one team, team A's hitters against team B's pitchers, and they're going to go nine innings, and they're going to score some amount of runs. And then fairly independently, the other team's the other pair of hitters and pitchers are going to play their nine innings and score their runs. Now, of course, there's some adjustment. If a team gets a big lead, the other team might put in, you know, a weaker pitcher, a weaker relief pitcher because they've got a 10-run lead. They don't need to worry. So there is some interaction, but, but not that much. And so you could probably model this pretty well by having two separate, two separate effects of Here's, here's the team's hitters, here's the team's pitchers and bullpen. What's the distribution of runs scored that you expect? And then separately doing it for the other pair. And then adding up those two probability distributions, getting the probability distribution of exceeding a particular number. So I think this might be effective and might have a chance for a little more of an edge than just the, the win-loss part. And a second effect of, of doing this is that this model for runs scored might help us with the money line model. Now, why is this? This is a kind of an abstract principle, but I'm going to try to describe it a little bit, which is you've got your features, we'll call them A. These features affect your outcome, win or loss, which we'll call C. Now, when you're trying to predict C with A, and you know that the only way, the only pathway by which A can affect C is through B. Then it's often better to say, let me build a model for how A affects B, and then have another model for how B affects C. So what's going on here? We've got, for example, a bunch of hitting and hitting features for a team. How are they affecting C, whether they win the game or lose the game? They're only affecting it through B, through scoring runs. Now, there's some noise between B and C, though, right? Because you might have games where the team hits really well, you have a really good hitting team, and they score a lot of runs, but then they lose because they gave up even more runs, right? And similarly, they might score very few runs, have a bad day, and still win. So there's a lot of noise between how many runs you score and whether or not you won the game. So because of that, it might be useful to really build this model of run scored and integrate that model then into the, the, the overall did you win or lose. So really kind of trying to break apart those two pieces so that you don't lose some of the noise. When you have a lot of steps between your features and there's a lot of source of noise till the end, it's going to be very hard to model. And you'll often do better if you can capture the individual steps with individual models. So we'll talk more about that going forward. Um, but that's all we have for the notebook. I'd like to, again, ask you if you could like and subscribe uh, to the channel. It really helps me out. Um, again, our next video, we will get, we'll show how to get this individual batter data, build some features, and then we'll have another video where we add those features into the lineup and see how much, how much additional uh, performance we can get out of the model. And then after that, I think I'm going to pivot a little bit and look at this run scored and see how well we can do about predicting the over and under. So that's, that's our roadmap going forward as I see it right now. So I hope you'll continue watching these videos. I uh, really enjoy all the comments and, and all the feedback I've gotten from people. So please keep watching and uh, have a great day. I'll see you in the next video.